Hello, and welcome to the Serial Talker Podcast. I'm Peter Von Gom, and today we're going to get into part four of this intriguing story about Silk Road and the takedown of this dark web marketplace that Ross Ulbricht started in 2011. And what's so fascinating about this is the speed at which it grew in such a short amount of time, it became this global marketplace for illicit dealings. Brilliant, but on the wrong side of the law. Let's get into it, shall we? The descent was stunning. Chris Tarbell, a special agent from the New York FBI office, was in a window seat, watching a green anomaly in a sea of blue as it resolved into Iceland's severe, beautiful landscape. On approach to Keflavik International Airport, he could now see the city of Reykjavik coming into view, and just beyond that, perched on the edge of a moss-covered lava field, the massive matte white box that housed the Thor data center. That's why Tarbell and two U.S. attorneys had come all this way. Thor was the home of a computer with a very important IP address, one that Tarbell and his FBI colleagues had discovered back in New York, the hidden server for a vast online criminal enterprise called Silk Road. They'd been working on this case for months, as had federal agents across the country, in a wide-ranging digital manhunt for Dread Pirate Roberts, the mysterious proprietor of Silk Road, a clandestine online marketplace that functioned like an anonymous Amazon for criminal goods and services. Silk Road investigations had been launched by Homeland Security, the Secret Service, and the DEA office in Baltimore, where an agent named Carl Force had been working an undercover identity as Silk Road smuggler for more than a year. Tarbell and his team, known as Cyber Squad 2, or C2 for short, and the Deuce for fun, were relative newcomers to the case. The other agencies had dismissed the FBI, partly because of interagency bluster and partly because the traditional agents who thought casework was all guns and grime and grit had no respect for the eggheads from cybercrime. But in the midst of this enormous law enforcement effort, mostly fruitless thus far, Tarbell and CY2 had found the first promising lead in the case. Cybercrime agents spend a lot of time at their desks, and it was exciting to be in the field. Down below, they could see Iceland's fierce geology, all jutting rock built up from the water by volcanoes. Beneath the surrounding ocean are the massive cables that make the country an important location for web traffic. The island is nearly equidistant between North America and Europe, and its forbidding geography and climate reduce cooling costs and provide free geothermal power. One of the attorneys told Tarbell about Iceland's tectonic forces, the North American and Eurasian plates, slowly tearing open a growing chasm. Once on the ground in Reykjavik, Tarbell and the lawyers met with their counterparts and explained why they'd come. Silk Road had eluded law enforcement for almost three years because it ran on tour, a kind of cryptographic camouflage that made it nearly impossible to see the site's users, vendors, or servers, until Tarbell made a chance discovery. His investigation had started entirely at his desk, with virtual gumshoe diligence, poking around Tor's IP publishing protocol, and spending time on Silk Road, looking for chatter about the site's security. His lucky break came from a thread on Reddit, a user posted a warning that Silk Road's IP address was leaking, visible to other computers. Dread Pirate Roberts, or DPR, as he was often called, had been alerted to the problem by a user, but ignored the warning. Silk Road's success was making DPR arrogant. He had let down his guard, confidently telling colleagues that the site would never be found. Tarbell threw data at Silk Road, hoping to see the leak. He entered usernames with bad passwords and vice versa, and pasted data into input fields, all the while using regular old freeware to analyze network traffic and collect the IPs communicating with his machine. 
Then he tested those. On June 5, 2013, after staring at IP addresses for hours, Tarbell pasted one of them into a browser. And suddenly, there it was. The Silk Road CAPTCHA field. He showed it to fellow agent Ilwan Yum and to Tom Kiernan, the civilian computer technician who formed the technical backbone of the cyber squad. This was what the team had been waiting for. A misconfiguration somewhere on the site that revealed the real IP address of Silk Road, which Tarbell proceeded to trace all the way to the state-of-the-art facility in Iceland. What kind of data center has a foyer? The kind that also has a gleaming glass front and a spotless floor and houses the world's first zero-emission supercomputer. Cybercrime forensics often means untangling wires from machines stuck in some basement. Thor looked like the future. Past the foyer's key card entry was a former airplane hangar in which sat a double-high shipping container bright blue with silver ducts, full of servers. Inside were three rows of blades lined up floor to ceiling, flashing with blue lights. There was a chill in the air, and the thrum of a thousand fans, all powered by Vulcan forces from the rock below. The Icelandic authorities found the correct box and discovered that it had a mirror drive, a duplicate set of contents. They pulled the mirror, returned to Reykjavik, and handed the drive to Tarbell. And just like that, he was holding Silk Road in his hand. Even on first glance, the site's volume was surprising. On July 21, 2013, around the time Tarbell landed in Iceland, DPR's account received more than 3,000 transfers, totaling $19,000, which would give DPR an annualized income of more than $7 million. The data center also kept system logs for six months. They could see all the other computers that had recently communicated with this machine. It was an investigative windfall. After returning to New York, Tarbell started unspooling the electronic threads that led from the Iceland machine to computers around the world. They looked at traffic recorded for port 22, the encrypted connection where admins log in, and discovered several non-Tor IPs, a backup near Philadelphia, a hosting proxy server in France, a VPN in Romania. On the wall of the CY2 computer lab, Tarbell mounted an eight-foot sheet of plotter paper and constructed the classic crime investigation visual, with a skein of lines mapping the complicated relationship of leads and evidence. But rather than the traditional godfather surrounded by his capos, this chart centered around a server in Iceland and a sprawling cryptographic computer network. Tarbell was a visual thinker. He liked to see the connections. One of those connections was to an IP address that was the last known login to the Silk Road VPN. Next to it, Tarbell drew a question mark. A subpoena revealed the IP's physical location, Cafe Luna, Sacramento Street, San Francisco. When Homeland Security agents showed up at Ross Ulbricht's front door in San Francisco, his new roommates were surprised. They thought the quiet guy from Texas, who just rented their extra room for a thousand bucks, was named Joshua Terry. The agents must have found that interesting, since Joshua Terry wasn't one of the nine names they'd found in a stash of fake IDs at the Canadian Border Customs Office, all directed to this address and featuring Ross Ulbricht's picture. Ross had moved into this house after leaving Austin, where he'd grown up as a smart kid from a suburban family with an adventurous streak. Ross was handsome, charming, and always an overachiever, studying physics and engineering on scholarships. But he'd abandoned lab work to pursue an idea that brought together his technical smarts, entrepreneurial spirit, and newfound libertarian social philosophy, Silk Road. He'd come west to the mecca of startups, where he managed his powerful operation in secret. Even though Ross had only recently moved into this sublet in West Portal, a neighborhood of single-family homes and strollers, he'd scored the master bedroom. 
His roommates thought that the guy named Josh, who had answered their Craigslist ad, was a currency trader. They did think it was weird that he had no cell phone, paid in cash, and was always on his computer. Neither friends nor family had any idea that Ross had a secret alter ego. Online, he was Dread Pirate Roberts. Nor did they suspect that the young man who ran what began as a politically motivated black market had become the leader of a criminal organization, a ruthless operator who had decided to kill one of his employees as retribution for theft and as a sacrifice necessary to protect his political objectives. If Ross was nervous about being discovered when the Homeland Security agents interviewed him, he didn't show it. He didn't tell them that he'd bought the colorful array of fake IDs so he could covertly rent additional servers to deal with Silk Road's exploding scale and security challenges. The IDs were high-quality counterfeits, holographic features and all. But now they were in the hands of the Homeland Security agents at the front door. Ross was polite, but knew he could refuse any questions. Before the agents left, Ross did volunteer that, hypothetically, anyone could have shipped drugs or fake IDs to him via a website called Silk Road. A strange thing to mention, and duly noted by the agents, but they weren't there to talk about Silk Road, whatever that was. The agents left and took the fake IDs with them. Ross was spooked by the visit. He moved again a short time later to another sublet in the city's Glen Park neighborhood, but decided to use his real name. One of his new roommates, Alex, liked Ross right away because he was charismatic and easy to talk to, and Alex observed Ross's focus was impressive. He wasn't the type of guy to procrastinate watching cat videos on his Samsung 700Z. He didn't smoke or drink much, although he sometimes played his djembe, a West African drum and one of his few possessions. He never brought friends over and seemed not to have a single memento, nor did Ross get mail. Sometimes, one roommate said to Alex, I feel like Ross is hiding from someone. Still, they couldn't have guessed that Ross, the new guy in their cheap share, who liked giving hugs and hanging out shirtless, was sitting on their garage sale furniture with that Samsung on his lap, presiding over a criminal empire. Money is powerful, DPR wrote to the Silk Road faithful, and it's going to take power to affect the changes I want to see. By that time, DPR was a millionaire many times over, but those resources, he told his followers, were for the revolution. Freedom, after all, needs financing. DPR had founded Silk Road as a digital instantiation of the libertarian ideal, a frictionless marketplace where everyone had freedom as long as it didn't impinge on someone else's freedom. For DPR and the community that grew around him, Silk Road was about more than contraband. It was a movement. As Silk Road quickly grew, DPR's pronouncements became more grandiose. He wrote that every single transaction is a victory in weakening the thieving, murderous state. What began as a belief in free choice came to sound like revolutionary dogma. It made for ambitious business plans. DPR wanted to expand his liberty-fueled brand into an empire with his own Silk Road-affiliated Bitcoin exchange, credit union, and encrypted communication service. Buoyed by the quick success, DPR shared the heady enthusiasm of the licit startup world. Whereas he'd once considered selling Silk Road for $1 billion, he told a reporter in a rare encrypted chat interview that Silk Road was worth 10 figures, maybe 11. But behind the scenes, Ross faced constant crises. There were technical problems, management issues, a quickly changing marketplace, and the volatility of Bitcoin. There were scammers on the site. Blackmail, too, was a problem. Hackers had figured out how to launch denial-of-service attacks on Silk Road, and DPR was forced to pay protection to the tune of $50,000 a week. In May 2013, hackers shut down the site for a week, 
and many users wondered if it was the work of a competitor. Atlantis, a new Tor-based illicit goods bazaar, had just launched with a slick YouTube trailer and a group chat with reporters in which a spokesperson named Heisenberg offered the serious burn that Atlantis was the Facebook to Silk Road's MySpace. DPR's own staff was growing, although it was hard to find reliable subalterns. Batman 73, a dealer named Peter Nash in Australia, was a cokehead. Inigo ran the site's book club, which DPR appreciated, but was the kind of guy who lived part-time on a boat, smoked a lot of weed, and was as organized as that lifestyle might suggest. DPR liked Libertas, though, and Smed was solid, offering rapid-response technical support. The burden of leadership was getting to DPR, and his fluctuating moods played into the theory that the moniker was actually operated by multiple people. DPR encouraged this perception. In an interview with Forbes, he said that he was actually the successor to Silk Road's creator. It worked. On Silk Road, it became great speculative sport to decipher the many facets of DPR, with users believing they could even detect when the different DPRs took the reins. You're a busy guy. Actually, I think you're going to kill yourself said a friendly message sent to DPR by a Silk Road vendor named Knob. Take a vacation. DPR believed that Knob was a Puerto Rican cartel middleman named Eladio Guzman, but he was in fact DEA agent Carl Force. Force had spent more than a year developing his undercover identity on Silk Road in an effort to get close to DPR. They'd become confidants, spending nights chatting at such length that DPR trusted Knob when he needed enforcement muscle. It was Knob whom DPR hired to kill his employee, Curtis Green. Force then coerced Green into faking his own death as a ruse. Force was surprised to see DPR's moral collapse up close, but then again, he'd seen this kind of thing before during his younger DEA years in Undercover. He too had experienced the temptations that came with a double identity. In fact, his secret life as a hard partying operator had nearly destroyed his regular life. He'd left all that behind and recommitted himself to Christ. The Silk Road case was his first undercover role since those days, and it was a big one. Because of his tenure online as Knob, Force was able to carry out the supposed hit on Green, setting DPR up for a murder conspiracy indictment while at the same time cementing their relationship. Knob and DPR had become comrades in arms. Now, Knob wanted to capitalize on DPR's apparent struggle. You need a contingency plan, Knob wrote. Force hoped that the mounting paranoia would eventually allow him to orchestrate what DPR would believe to be an escape right into the arms of the DEA. DPR confided his worries about L.E., or law enforcement, not realizing that he was talking to the DEA. That might have been a lapse in judgment in a realm that was full of speculation about narcs and informants. But DPR wanted to believe his friend Knob. Silk Road, after all, was built on DPR's confidence system. And besides, he was lonely. I have no one to share my thoughts with. DPR posted to the wider Silk Road community at one point. Security does not permit it, so thanks for listening. DPR had also gotten lazy with his operational security. That diary he kept was a bad idea for starters. Growing vanity had become a weakness. DPR's self-taught programming was catching up with him as well, leaving holes in Tor's invisibility cloak. And yet, he would tell his admins there was nothing that could get traced back to them. When one user with a technical background private messaged DPR to warn him that he should know the precise physical location of his servers, DPR brushed it aside. The tipster warned that the servers could be copied easily. Don't worry, DPR said. The servers are secure. Back in New York, Kiernan was busy recreating the entire Silk Road system in their lab. Once it was configured, 
Tarbell and his team could access the system as super users, seeing Silk Road as DPR, and learn the site's mechanics, communications, and structure. It was thrilling, of course, to fire it up for the first time. They wondered what they would see. Tarbell could immediately appreciate DPR's sense of industry, how hard he worked to expand and manage the site under incredible duress. Tarbell thought, I guess he's really earning that commission. It was impressive, especially because Tarbell could tell that DPR was not a professional programmer. The server was a noisy box, clearly the work of an autodidact, a coding palimpsest that invited eventual discovery. The pseudocode was full of comments describing various technical experiments that were often run on the live server. Kiernan and Yum found the private messages, the forums, a Bitcoin escrow account from which DPR extracted his cut every Saturday night, and the main Bitcoin server showing all vendor transactions. They spent a lot of time in the lab, which they dubbed the War Room. It felt like college finals week in there, every day. The group would churn through Silk Road material, bringing lunch in from the deli downstairs and getting loopy by the afternoon when Tarbell would call for his seltzer break and dance around with the bottle, singing the mellow gold classic Afternoon Delight. While Yum and Kiernan worked on the machines, Tarbell combed through 1,400 pages of DPR's chat logs so as to really understand him. DPR was different things to different people, sometimes solicitous and businesslike, other times volatile and narcissistic. Eventually, he embraced murder as a necessary business practice. Reading through DPR's correspondence, Tarbell was surprised to find evidence of more hired assassinations, this time a response to blackmailers. It was a complicated scenario, but what Tarbell put together was that a user called Friendly Chemist was blackmailing DPR. Another user called Red and White, claiming to be a member of the Hells Angels, agreed to kill the blackmailer, and soon others, for a handsome fee, of course. In an email, DPR wrote, In my eyes, Friendly Chemist is a liability, and I wouldn't mind if he was executed. I have the following info. Blake Krokoff lives in an apartment near White Rock Beach, age 34, province, British Columbia, wife and three kids. Always the businessman, DPR, first invited the Hells Angels to become vendors on Silk Road, suggesting that Red and White read the wiki and forums. Then the two got back to the cost of murder. Hitmen apparently get a commission, according to this Hell's Angel, if the target owes money. And if you want it to look like an accident, rates go up. A clean hit would cost about $300,000, travel expenses included. DPR had sticker shock. After all, he'd paid only $80,000 for the Curtis Green hit. They haggled. He wrote, don't want to be a pain here, but the price seems high. Not long ago, I had a clean hit done for 80000 Are the prices you quoted the best you can do? Red and White wrote, I'm sorry, but we can't do anything for that price. Best I can do is one fifty, and even that is pushing it. In the interest of a business relationship to be, the Hells Angels agreed to 150000 or 1,655 bitcoins at the time. Good luck and be safe, was DPR's sign-off. The next day they debriefed. Red and White wrote, Your problem's been taken care of. Rest easy, though, because he won't be blackmailing anyone again, ever. Dread Pirate, excellent work. Tarbell had never seen anything like it. Here was a date and time-stamped record of an entire criminal conspiracy as it unfolded. Turned out, Red and White told DPR the blackmailer they killed was working with another guy known on Silk Road as Tony76, an infamous scammer. DPR didn't hesitate to add him to the invoice. But Tony76 had housemates, and they were also involved. Maybe, probably. Fine, DPR said, get them too, and send photographic proof when the job is done. Meanwhile, DPR and Red and White spent some time troubleshooting the Hells Angels' new chat app and privacy plug-in. 
please upload some screenshots of the settings. While also planning and pricing, no bulk discounts. The next set of executions. Tarbell had been reading DPR's correspondence in reverse order, and it was a strange thing, winding DPR's life backward from willing executioner back into idealist concerned with individual happiness. Some libertarian utopia, Tarbell thought. Although he wasn't exactly surprised, all systems are vulnerable to corruption. Like the internet itself, which began as a wonderful free prairie until people took advantage of that freedom. That's why, he thought, it needed a sheriff. Up on Tarbell's chart was an IP address with a name next to it. Frosty. This was an ID they'd found on the Iceland box. But they didn't know what it meant until Yum and Kiernan cross-referenced it with some other evidence they'd collected. It turned out that the Silk Road servers had a login system that created one trusted computer for all the other machines, whose encryption keys all ended with Frosty at Frosty. This meant that these computers shared one key friend, a single machine they could all talk to. Tarbell looked at his chart, festooned with a network topology. One of those nodes must be Frosty, and whoever sat at its keyboard was Dread Pirate Roberts. As the case accelerated, Tarbell and his team started working long hours and weekends, jackets off, sleeves rolled up, long past the late dusks of summer. Tarbell actually loved that feeling on Friday at 5 p.m. when the air conditioner turned off automatically, the bullpen emptied and grew quiet, and he realized he'd been yelling all day but could now finally think. Except that it was high summer. This being a federal building, the air conditioning was on a timer. There'd be no circulation until Monday at 8.15 a.m. So by midday on Saturday, when the place was boiling, Tarbell would strip down to his underwear, right at his desk. The only room with constant air conditioning was the lab, which had to be cooled because of the electronics. So one day, Tarbell and Yum made a desperate attempt to transport some of the chill to their desks using fans. It kind of worked, and there they sat in the middle of the FBI office, Tarbell sweating in his skivvies, with a football game on in the background and a series of fans stretching back to the well-cooled room where the ersatz Silk Road server hummed along, still keeping one key secret. Wow, there is a lot of bad apples in this story, and Ross Ulbrich being the grand poobah of the bad apples. My God, he got the Hell's Angels involved for his hits. Crazy stuff, man. Well, this was part four. There are more parts coming, so keep your pants on. The story ain't over. If you like this kind of podcast, please consider subscribing. It's a weekly podcast. Always true stories, usually true crime. If you would like to support the podcast, you could always buy me a coffee. The details are in the description. And also, if you have a compelling true story that you would like me to consider reading, by all means, send me an email with that information, and those details are also in the description. Thanks always, guys. We'll see you for Part 5, coming up on the Serial Talker Podcast. Take care. Ciao. Ciao.